setting effective practice. <laughs> I guess it's slightly different. There are two different ways you can say effective practice setting and setting effective practice. But we want to be effective in all ways, right? So let's just start with a little exercise. Um, if you're watching online, you can do it as well. But just take two minutes to write as many things as you can in two minutes about setting effective practice. Effectively setting effective. Setting practice. Two things, two minutes to just write all your, like, just mm -hmm. a load of thoughts about it. Okay. Four hours now, right? Not four hours students. For your students. Four hours students. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Very good point. <laughs> um, is this like how you would structure your lesson? Is that what we are? Yeah, about? that's part of it. I see. How do you equip the parents with a good understanding of what they need to go away and do and support them in being able to do it? Your two minutes starts now. One minute. Yeah, I would say it confused me a lot uh, the word you chose. Setting effective practice before our students come or when our students in the studio? In the studio. Okay. To the parents. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay, so just finish up whatever you're writing about now and then we'll talk about it. teacher being able to support the parents and students in doing good practice 
has got to be right up there because that's what they're going to do most of, just in terms of time in, time out. Yeah? So, would you like to share something that you think? Yeah. Um, for example, if a lesson is drawn, you can ask the child and the parent to get ready, prepare, and come here to the next revision we will make a preparation for a child. That's lesson preparation. Oh, this is okay. practice preparation. This is setting, helping them understand what to do at home. Oh. Can you think of something that is important for them to do at home? I will come to the things. Okay, I'll well just, 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 just think about it now, don't worry. I'll come back to you. Yeah. <laughs> Sarah? Make sure that the parent, so the parent they need to get everything ready before they summon the child so that very good. Goes through yeah, so help the parent know what it is for themselves to be prepared. Yeah. Very good. Uh, in the lesson, I say keep preparing the measures all the time and make sure they understand and ask them if necessary to replicate what you say. Yes, exactly. They know how to do it. And that. I think that the thing of getting them to do it, I don't think there are very many ways for us to know, certainly when we first start working with a family. It's very difficult to know whether they whether it's necessary or not. So then, how are we going to deal with that? Mm, I mean, if necessary, uh, in this bit, it was like if it is if I say okay, now at home we will do clapping of the ribbons and doing this. Yeah, I think I would, they don't have to replicate. But uh, the ball hole, for example, I would ask them to do. Okay, it great. So according to what the thing is, yeah. yeah. So if you think that they might not know how to do it. Definitely get them to do it in the lesson. Excellent. Another thing, um, no rush at all, one thing at a time, because child cannot keep their all hand on at the same time in their environment. Yeah, for example, good. Just focus on the one for you. Excellent. Excellent, yes. So let's go another round of things that will help in this situation. Sarah, can you think of something else? Would you have something else? Um. Make a clear, concise list of points and kind of program for them to practice. But I, but I do realise that because I always say can do a warm up and do this, that, but it's quite good to give them the flexibility if the child wants to start with I don't know perpetual motion or whatever they want, and then go back to something. But have a vague plan anyway. Yes, a clear list of contents. Yeah, like it's like a recipe, isn't it? Mm. Practice is like trying to make a cake. You need to put in the different things. Uh, you can't make a cake without, well, okay, you can, but you know, it's harder <laughs> to make a cake without eggs, without flour, yeah. without sugar. So you have to make sure that you've got the requisite parts and that you communicate that effectively to the parent. And also the objectives of each thing. Good, yeah. And why is that important? Otherwise they could just stand there, like, okay, we've done that, we've done this, um, and we might have given them twinkle to focus specifically on retakes. Yeah. And then they think, okay, well, I've just done twinkle. And so <coughs> we need to explain why they're doing each thing, especially exactly. if it's pleasing. Yeah, exactly. So why they're doing it, how they can assess whether it's successful or not. And also because, I mean, I think this is a kind of basic respect thing, isn't it? If you're going to ask someone to do something, it's always going to be more effective if they have buy-in. So you yeah. show them why mm -hmm. it matters. You might want them to do... 20 retakes on A string. They know how to do a retake. If you just say to them, okay, do your 20 retakes every day, and then da da da, it's very unlikely that they're going to come back the next week having done 20 retakes every practice. Mm. Whereas if you say, we're coming up towards Allegro, Allegro's got loads of retakes in it, and you're going to be so good at Allegro if you do these retakes every day, yeah. then that child is suddenly thinking, this is getting me ready for something that I'm really excited about. Not yeah. just like, ugh, 20 retakes on A, whatever. I mean, I think 20 is quite a lot, maybe 10. But, you know, you have to have buy-in from both the parents and the child. Good. Jackie, any other thoughts? Um, so, uh, tell them very clearly to the parents what you expect them to practice at home. It will go a little bit with uh, Elon was saying, um, saying everything, because sometimes your expectations does not meet the parents' expectations. 
sometimes there will be one to do something they are, the kid is not ready for it and then it will just be frustrating for the kid so that way it's something what you expect to from, from them at home yes exactly well done anything else uh, but i think it's helping the kid um, remind the parents that keep going back and play the old musical around great so very good <laughs> so we have two sort of things happening here how you deliver the information you know effectively to the parent. So the practicalities of how you get everything in here mm -hmm. over to them. And then understanding, being a good teacher, understanding what you need to set. What are their priorities for this piece? What if you're doing preview for something, what's going to help them with that? Mm -hmm. Having the knowledge and being able to communicate that and, and sort of summon it at the right time about why you need to do this, what do you need to do to get better at that, and actually how the practice is going to help with whatever the thing they're working on is. So in terms of the, let's do the content first. So we need to be thinking, this is why the teaching points is such a big deal, we need to be thinking about where the child is in the repertoire, The Suzuki books are really helpful. They will show you what you need to do with your student up to a point. You know, you finish a piece, you can't remember the next piece, you turn the page, then you know what piece it is. Yeah. But there is so much other stuff, isn't there? Mm -hmm. So it's really important for us to have that awareness of like the triple layer thing. So you have your preview, your main piece, and your review, but also where they do extra things. So at what point do you start sight reading? How much sight reading should you be doing each practice? Uh, when are they going to join an orchestra? Do you need to ask about orchestra music? At what point will they start to do scales? At what point will they start to do studies? At what point will they start to have improvisation as part of their practice if they do all of these things? So it's like you have the kind of microcosm of what they're going to do in their practice and then you just like zoom out and out and out and make sure that you haven't forgotten something that is going to then like crash into it. Uh, so for level one, we're not, not really thinking about, well, we're certainly not thinking about studies. Mm -hmm. We're not thinking about scales apart from the GDNA that we have in the book. Um, and the sight reading is the big thing that you can easily forget about because it's not there in the Suzuki repertoire. Uh, what's the other thing that the parents need constant reminders about? Listen. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, as the kind of core components, shall I use the whiteboard or do you want to just write this down? Yeah. Okay, I just wrote it down. Great piece for me. <laughs> um, so, as the core components, you have preview, working piece, review. Do they have one of each normally? No. Talk about that in a second. Who's the structure of the day practice should look like? Is the what? The structure of the day practice should look like or how our lesson should look like? No, we're going to come to structure in a minute. We're just talking about contents at the moment. Ah. Uh, so those three are the big three. Then the listening is something you have to remember to remind them about and ask them about. Sight reading, pitch and rhythm separately during book one. And then the other thing that we have to be aware of is their ability to play by ear. Their ability to play by ear. Pitch separated from the rhythm, right? Oh, Pitch is separate from the rhythm, yeah. Really dry hands, but wash my hands so much. Oh. Um, okay, so we have the 
this sort of list of things that we're keeping in mind all the time. How do we help the parents also have that list, not probably in mind, but available to them? How do we help the parent um, be effective in practice? And literally, how do we set that practice in the lessons? So the basic answer to how do we make sure the parent has access to that is parent education. How to help, sorry, one of the continue. So, so, so that are... list of things, preview, review, working piece, sight reading, listening, playing by ear, mm -hmm. we have to keep it in mind kind of all the time, mm -hmm. but we also have to make sure that the parent is aware that that's the sort of package for level one, mm -hmm. book one, sorry. And where it changes, you know, when they first start their twinkles, they can't do any review, they don't know anything yet. <laughs> they can't do, uh, they can do preview because it's coming up, they can't do any sight reading yet. So they've only got three things, and then where we add in the sight reading um, and review. And so the basic answer is that that is part of parent education and why we can't just teach the child in front of us and then set the practice and that's it is because we have to constantly keep updating the parents knowledge and reminding them about the things that they've already learned about because there is so much mm -hmm. and we can't assume that when we said it to them once it's gonna stick because mm -hmm. I mean I don't know about you <laughs> not very much that gets said to me once sticks forever in my mind um, even if I'm really interested in it. So we have to make sure that we are regularly taking time out from actually teaching the child, like in that moment, how to do whatever they're next going to do, and talking to the parent about, you know, this is why like playing by ear is so important, it's because, you know, then they can, then the, the, the process of them learning becomes so much quicker because they're just working out what they already know how to do it on the instrument, rather than working out what to do and then how to do it and then executing it. Uh, you know, and, and talking to the parent about like, how do you think your child learns what is most useful for them? Do you feel confident to do little games like high or lower where you have to sing? Some parents won't feel confident to do that. So in that case, if they're not confident to do that, get them to download an app that's got a little piano keyboard on it and they can literally just hit the notes on their, on their um, phone. Um, other parents will have loads of questions about playing by ear because they're musicians and they never did, or they're musicians and they did, or you know they've heard this or whatever it is. Like I think it's really important to create a space where there is chat mm -hmm. as well as teaching because otherwise you kind of build this relationship with the parents where they feel that they can't ask you things mm -hmm. and then they don't understand as much as they'd like to and then they start to switch off. So you have to make space to talk about what's happening and make sure that the parent gets the bigger picture as well as you do. Not as well as you do, as well as you having the bigger picture. Um, and then we have to be very clear about what we're actually asking them to do, like you said. We have to be very clear about what they're expected to do at home. I've watched loads and loads of lessons that are lovely lessons in terms of getting information from the teacher to the student and to their parent. And then where the practice, the teacher is assuming that the parent will do the practice of what they've done in the lesson. Mm -hmm. So let's say if you have a half an hour lesson with a five-year-old who can play lightly row, mm -hmm. and you do a twinkle variation, you are fixing their technique, you are helping them to make better sound, you might do, you know, E1, E, A3, three times, five times. Um, you might, you know, play with I play, you play to get the tone improved. You might do all sorts of things as part of that lesson. Uh, so maybe that takes 10, 15 minutes. And then, um, and then you hear like you row and you give them information about how they can make it better. And you say, can you do this bit as a box? Do, 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 for example. 
And they say yes, and then you say, okay, and let's do a little bit of preview for some of the wind, and you teach them how to do a retake. And then you do a bow and they go. What is that parent supposed to do at home? The box. The box? That's it. I mean, that parent might think they're supposed to recreate that whole lesson, which between most parents and children will take about three times as long as the lesson because the children don't do what the parents are asking in the same way as they do what the teacher's asking. They might think, okay, we did a twinkle, or that particular twinkle, we did lightly row, she asked me to do the box, and then we did some retakes. So they might do one twinkle variation, no improvement, no working on it, just play it through. Lightly row, play the box twice, because a box is just something you do more than once, and then do a retake. Genuinely, I think lots of parents would think that that is what they're expected to do. Mm. So it's on us to clarify when we say things like work on this, mm -hmm. work. it's <laughs> really unhelpful. Mm. What does it mean to work on something? If you don't play an instrument, even if you do play an instrument, we have to really spell out exactly what we're expecting in practice. So let's imagine this five-year-old who's just had this lesson on lightly row, could you write down what you think should actually be in that practice? Step by step. This number of activities, this number of times. Go. <laughs> For that lesson that I've just described. what the practice should be. In an ideal world, mm -hmm. that you would, if you were an angel looking down and then doing their practice that day, that's what they would do. Mm -hmm. The content. My English is not good. <laughs> it's okay, your English is very good. Do you understand now what you're supposed to do? No, I did. I'm confused about So that. number one, what should be the first thing they do in their practice? They do, the parents, right? In the end, at home, what they should do. Yeah, what, what, what I is tell them to do? Yeah, what, it doesn't matter which, it's the same thing. What should it be? What is the contents of the practice? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So number one, play a twinkle variation. Okay. If we haven't all got that, then. You said something about doing a, a, a finger thing. Which was that in Twinkle? I can't remember what you said. E1, E A3. Okay. Just to get the oh. preparation ready. So what do you think we actually want them to do in their practice? Um, there is something I'm a bit confused about. Should I tell you first? Yeah. Um, okay, so basically you start with a twinkle variation. Yeah. Um, and say you do it thinking specifically about sort of whatever the child's with or their left hand or their right hand. As, you know, whatever. So, um, no, actually start with the E1A, E1EA3. 
I don't think that's a very nice start for a tile to dive straight into a box. Okay. I think it's nicer to, I would say that 95% of all practices start with something that you're not really thinking very much about. Yeah. With the best girl in the world, you just want them, especially when they're five yeah. year old, you just want them to play something. Okay, let's play busy, busy, stop, stop. You know, if you're lucky, let's make a good bow hold, put your violin up properly, think about your waterfall, but you know, it's going to be pretty scrappy, basically, probably. Yeah. Mm. So, we can call that the warm up. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Yeah. Next thing. I said, and so the start would be the review of the tempo, and we spend a lot of time, not a lot of time, but most of the time on that, checking posture and so on. Then we would do the main piece. If they are just doing the boxes, then we just practice the box. Okay. Here we Next thing. Love them. Should I read? No, let's talk. We're, we, well, unless you think we've missed something. So we've done a twinkle variation to warm up. We've worked on the twinkle variations. We have done the working piece, maybe the boxes, maybe the whole thing. Okay. Uh, she said we're checking the bow hold and the violin hold, right? Yeah. So like, yeah. Like, no. Okay. So then we would be playing high and low gain. Excellent. Um, well done. Very good. <laughs> So you might play the high, high and low game. Excellent. And then, and retakes, what? retakes, retakes. Uh, um, some of the wings. So you might do either just on the edging or grace or something. Great. So you all have a really brilliant understanding of what that practice is supposed to be. But if we had told the parent what we have just said, it's like the peanut butter and jam sandwich. There are all of these ways in which they can misunderstand us. Start with a twinkle, which one? Maybe that means it doesn't matter, but maybe it does matter. Then work on the twinkles, how many? Okay. What does working on look like? Thinking about the bow hold and the, and the violin position, great. Then do the box, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Then work on the working piece, what does that mean? <laughs> then do some retakes, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. I'm not criticizing you, but it's just a demonstration of if someone says, I'm gonna take a walk, do you expect them back in an hour and a half's time or in five minutes time? If you need to know when they're coming back, you need to find out how long that walk is gonna be. Practice is similar, yeah? Like the peanut butter and jelly mm -hmm. game. Okay, start with it. So this is what you might say to the parent and this is what we're coming towards is the way to do this is to stop the lesson teaching, do the bow three or four minutes early, mm -hmm. every time. It's one of the hardest things because in our minds, the child comes from 3.30 till four, we finish at four, the next child walks in. But you have to train yourself to finish, do the bow, maybe you'll even set an alarm on your phone, 26 minutes in. You have to describe to the parent why this is important. You have to get the parents buy-in because I've heard parents here say, oh, I need to talk to you because my teacher always finishes the lesson early. And I was like, oh, what happens then? She says, then we talk about practice, she makes sure that I understand what I'm supposed to do, and then I go home. But she's not teaching my child for half an hour. Really? This is not someone, this is someone, more than one person said this, this is not someone being a pain on purpose. This is someone who thinks the lesson is the time that my child has the attention of their teacher and the bow starts at the beginning and the bow finishes at the end and that should be the 30 minutes that I'm paying for. Mm -hmm. And when I say to them, well, which do you think is the most useful part of that for you, helping your child practice at home? Well, I don't know. Okay, well, I think the reason that your child is finishing their part of the lesson four minutes early is because the parent and the teacher need to be really on the same page about what you're doing at home. And that takes time. And it's much easier for you, for your notes, and much easier for the teacher to establish what those are at the end. So you take your normal notes, you write down whatever you think is helpful, the teacher doesn't check on that. And then you get to the end and the teacher says, right, this is your practice, please write it down or please take a video of me saying this. Mm -hmm. uh, and then suddenly you have like, oh, right. <laughs> because if you finish the lesson 30 minutes after you started it, and then everybody takes three to four minutes to talk about their practice, then the sixth lesson in a row is half an hour late. Yeah. Yeah. Which has also happened, which is much more of a problem. That's what happened to me. Um, yeah. Um, so we have to train ourselves to finish early, finish early, and do the practice talk. Yes. It, uh, with the children, because some people, they think that their child has to be respectful and concentrating while you're talking to them, and they keep saying, come on, Jimmy, listen to what we're saying. 
Is it acceptable to say that? Can you give them some Lego while I tell you? I think that is, yes. Yeah, I think it absolutely is. I think also we have to be careful because some parents know that the child will do it more readily if they've heard us set it. Yeah. Sometimes it might be, come on, Jimmy, listen, because if they don't listen, then they'll be like, I'm not going to do it. My teacher didn't tell me I had to. Oh, okay. Yeah. Which happens a lot. Yeah. So I think if you're finding that it's slowing everything down by the parent being like, come on, you've got to listen to Sarah, ask them why they're doing it. Ask them if oh, that's yeah. the issue. Is the issue just that they don't want you to be upset because they think that you want their kids' attention yes, at all times? Yes. Or is it actually because when I don't do that, something happens that you're not aware of? So yes. just ask. Yeah. So when we get to the 26 minutes of the lesson, of a half an hour lesson, and we do the practice, we do the bow, and then we're talking about practice. A practice setting for this would be something like this. And if you can imagine writing it down, you'll see why we need three or four minutes to do it, not just one, because you, if you just rattle it off, they're not gonna remember. Okay, so, so this is going to be an ideal practice. Maybe you won't have time to do it every single day. Maybe you won't have time to do all of it every single day, but this is what I want you to aim for. Mm -hmm. Choose a twinkle variation to start with. I don't mind which one it is. Get your child as well set up as you can and then just let them do it. Don't stop them if it goes wrong. Just let them warm up with it and get into the vibe of, of practicing. Then I'd like you to do, on busy busy stop, stop, E1, E, A3, Make sure you're thinking about the third finger getting ready so there's no gap. And you're gonna try and do five really good ones. So if they don't go right, you're not gonna count them. You can use pennies to show that they've done them. You can use toys, or you can just count them. It depends how willing your child is. So you've got that five box to help with your twinkles. And then in an ideal practice, it'd be great if you could do three, twin three more twinkles. I don't think many students at five years old are gonna play all of their twinkle variations and theme. Um, that's just an aside. So to the parent, I'm saying, okay, if you can do three twinkles, but at least two, so they've played half of them every day. Uh, so you choose which ones you wanna do. You can theme them, you can do the short bow ones, you can do the ones with stopped bows, you can do the big bows. Uh, you know, it's up to you. I don't really mind as long as you do them in rotation so that every couple of days they've played all of their twinkle variations. Just keep checking the bow hold, keep thinking about the waterfall, keep making sure that the bows are straight, the violet position looks okay. And you know, don't expect the child to just rattle through three in a row. Give them a little break in between. You could do a reading practice. Uh, you know, they might need to have a little snack in between, have a drink of water, whatever, that's completely fine. Between their twinkle variations? Yeah. And then when you come to the bit on Lightly Row that you're ready to work on, I'd like to do the box first. And again, like the E1, E, A3 box, you're trying to only count the really good ones. But if they're finding it really tricky, make sure that you are judging it so that you're not putting them off. So it might be three attempts, or it might be three really good ones, or that might be from the beginning of the week, it might just be three attempts. And then by the end of the week, you might be saying, oh, that wasn't a very good one, let's do it again. Uh, and they'll be able to do three really good ones, or five, or however many it is. Uh, then I want you to have a go at all of Lightly Row. If that's not the stage that they're at yet, just try a line. If they can't remember any of it, you can sing it instead, you can bow it in the air, you can watch my video on it. Uh, just do something that engages them with Lightly Row and makes them feel that they've got a relationship with that piece. Then we're going to see if we can do 10 retakes on the E string, ready for Song of the Wind. A nice game you can play is start on one side of the room and take a step every time they do a good one. See if they can get from one side of the room to the other. Or again, you can give them a sticker for each good one or collect little toys. You know, just keep the fun in the practice as much as you can. And be really reassuring and really encouraging. If it goes wrong, just say, oh, that one was a bit rubbish, wasn't it? Let's do it again. Don't punish the child for not having got it right. And then to finish, you're gonna do the high and low game maybe five rounds, get the app on your phone or, or sing them and put the violin down and do the you know higher, lower uh, game that we've done in your lesson today so you can see all that we've done before. Um, in terms of the order of the practice, I don't really mind what order you do it in as long as you start with the twinkle. Mm. So then you can ask the child to choose if they prefer, you know, that's fine. Um, but just see if you can get, so what is that? That's a warm up, twinkles, Boxes, lightly row, higher and lower, 
and retakes, that's six things. I think at this level, most practices have sort of five to six activities. And for most parents and most students, that's gonna take about half an hour to get through. One of two progressive. Uh, working piece, retakes, and higher up. You would do the box for like the loaded boys with like the women. Ideally, yes. I mean, I have a child who's never done a box with a working piece because she just refuses. <laughs> She's made it to mid book five. <laughs> it's not a complete deal breaker. But so that little spiel that I gave took me three minutes to just say, and that's without them writing down. So this is why it's really important to leave the time and to be ultra specific about what it is. If you say do the box, even if it says in the book times five, they often won't know what that means and they often won't look at the book because they don't understand it and the child's not looking at it. So what's the point? So it's really helpful to be very prescriptive, again, like a recipe. 250 grams of flour, not just flour. Mm. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I couldn't make a cake if it just told me the ingredients and not the actual amounts. No. But if we say to the parents, this is what you need to practice, that's so the same you, thing. What do you say about the box being specific? Because I have actually opened it back. About? The box. What, I mean, what did you say to make it sound more specific? Because I was... How many times? Or how many times, yeah. And also whether you're counting attempts or successful uh, yeah. executions. <laughs> so it's, it's so basically would be what they need to do, how they need to do, and what they need to look for. When yeah, they do. exactly. And I think it's uh, not every week, but it's really helpful occasionally, like once a half term, once a month maybe, to have a chat with them about, look, this is the ideal, this is a gold star practice. If you're not going to be able to do that every day, these are the bits that we want you to do. So do a twinkle, then do one twinkle variation, but give the same amount of focus to how well you're doing it, rather than do three without talking about what you're thinking about. Do the box five times, but then just play the first line of Lightly Row, because the box is more useful than trying to work all the way through Lightly Row. Higher and lower, you can do some days and not others. And retakes, you know, do five, not ten. Um, but make sure that as they go through the process of becoming more adept at practicing, that you are teaching them how to assess what is most important, what are the things that they really can't forget and what are the things that they can miss out. Mm -hmm. Especially because as we go through, review is the thing that the parents will think is less important. Mm -hmm. And we need to really change that approach of theirs to being review is what is gonna make the working piece more easy. And so if you are going to, if you've only got 10 minutes to practice and you've got a child who'll do three things in that 10 minutes, do two review pieces and one box. Don't do two boxes and have a go at the working piece. Mm -hmm. okay. Does that make sense? Does twinkle count as a review piece? Yeah. Okay. Even to advance more, someone at the end of book one? Yeah. I think by the end of book one, I'm thinking about warm up being different is often tonalization or a twinkle. Mm. Um, but yeah, uh, I think this is the last part of this conversation is how that changes as we go through the book. So that was a sort of lightly row level practice. Mm -hmm. By the time you're on perpetual motion, lots of things are gonna be the same. You can still start with a twinkle warm up. Um, mm -hmm. They might have an exercise instead of the twinkle box to do. It might be the four finger exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, then you're gonna pick, hopefully, five review pieces. You would probably want them to pick something that is going to help them with their working piece. So pick the staccato pieces this week, or one day play all of the odd number pieces and the next day play all of the even number pieces, but pay particular attention to the ones that are staccato because they're going to help you with perpetual motion. When you get to perpetual motion, you might have one or two boxes, do them first, and then have a go, and unless they're quite keen, they probably won't want to do the doubles and the singles, so choose, okay, so if you're trying to get your credit on the doubles, maybe just do the doubles, if you're trying to blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And then you've got to have something preview, and you're going to have something for sight reading. 
I really try, even though I haven't said this right now, I really try to get my parents to do the sight reading second. Do the warm up and then do the sight reading because it always falls off the end. When you go to these stuff, in which piece do you start the By go to that reading. Okay? Good. Okay, thank you very much. You have to go, don't you? Yes. yes. Do you have any more questions about that? Maybe. <laughs> Ever in your life, speak now or hold your peace. <laughs> So maybe we should just talk about what that practice would look like by the end of the book. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you think? So by the time your student is on Glossa Glovart, mm. let's do the same exercise we did at the beginning, well similar, mm. write down, could you write down a gold star practice for a student on Glossa Glovart? What are those components? Shall I go to outside? <laughs> Just make sure, Irem, that you watch the last 10 minutes of the video at home this week. Yes. We're just talking about how it would change by the end of the book. Yes. Video making a harder page, or is this the video? Oh, very good. So, this is one of the things I was going <coughs> to say. <coughs> Excuse me. To be on Gothic of Art could mean all sorts of things, couldn't it? Yeah. So, you choose whatever you want it to mean.
one, what would you do for Susie if you were performing? You could just write Susie in. Okay. And we'll talk about it, but very good, well done. <laughs> I'm so glad I actually can talk about this. Two more minutes.
need to establish what it means to do sight reading. Yeah. Or as part of your sum up. So for your sight reading, we're trying to catch up because we're hoping that we're going to get to the end of book one soon and we're hoping that we can get to the end of I Can Read Music also really soon, but we're only on lesson 28 and there are 50 lessons in I Can Read Music book one. So see if you can do a whole page of pitch and a whole page of rhythm every practice. That's a lot of Sundays you won't be able to do it. But see if you can do that because then it'll only take another 32 days to get through to whatever. Yeah. Uh, whereas if you just say, just do the sight reading, they may do one line of pitch. The next day they may do one line of rhythm. I have also had my own students misunderstand that you do not do review on sight reading. So they've done <laughs> the same page for seven days in a row, which is very impressive in some ways and very stupid of me not to review. So that's what they do. So I say to them, how much have you done your sight reading? And they say, oh yeah, we've done it every day. I'm like, but you've only done one page. And they're like, yeah. Well, do you, did you only do one line every day? No, we did the whole thing. She said we were re 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 <laughs> reviewing it, and I was like, "Oh, okay, I feel really bad now. Sorry." <laughs> so we talk about sight reading being like a takeaway. You just have it once, and then it's done. Mm -hmm. uh, so no review on sight, on sight reading. Not unless they need, uh, unless there's a problem, and then yeah, unlikely. Okay. Next, then I've got this. My this student. He's he did the four, the can do the four four lines. Okay. okay, great. But the second, we are practicing the second week, the part of the seven creatives. Mm -hmm. And I put uh, three steps for that. It would be C, F, F, like slow, slow, but not slow. Like we okay, slow, so. so that's brilliant, but we're going to talk about that because that's a massive preview that we start on minuet one. Okay. So by the time you do get here, that would be right if you, if that wasn't what was coming up. But by the time you get here, they will have been doing the eight famous notes for hopefully months. Okay. Um, but definitely you want the eight famous notes. Whatever level they're at on mm -hmm. Gossip Robot, they need the eight famous notes box. How many times, how, you need to be clear about. Sarah, the next thing? Um, well, actually doing it. Yeah. Box. And working on whatever bits. Well, probably other boxes. You're probably going to have put them in boxes, the bits they need to repeat, because most kids and most parents at this level don't have the skills to play it, identify what should be in a box, do the box, and then choose how many numbers, how, how, what number of times to do it. So that's why the boxes are so helpful. Oh no. Is it on my very expensive? Boots is going weird. <laughs> you need to find the boot again as well. Anyway, I can't use it. Um, I think I can do it myself with flyers if I just remember. Uh, okay, so then to All finish. Because we're definitely just saying that particular box. But then we will get to. Well, this is, yeah, so this is something that we will work on out when we yeah. get to that piece yeah. that we've done how to teach it. So that's, mm -hmm. yeah. The boxes that they're on mm -hmm. at that stage. Mm -hmm. Great. And then you might have, like you said, some preview. It might be finding a harmonic, doing early shifting. It might be, um, it won't be a box in, in book two because the first two pieces aren't hard enough to need preview. But you know, yes, you should always have the question what would, what preview is in this practice? Is in book, book two, is there shifting exercises? Or do we just do whatever we need? Uh, long answer. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, actually, it's a really good subject. Too. Yeah, made shorter. Let's talk about shifting another time. Yeah. But we, we cover it in depth in level two. So, what would, so, just to get back to just, okay, we've done the boxes and then we do work on the piece, so we're working on the box. Um, what would you say to them then? Just to play it through. Try to play as much as you can, I guess. Yeah, play it through or focus on one bit. If you're trying to get your credit for the first two lines, Maybe see if you can practice it, play it through, do your box, or boxes, play it through. If you're happy with it, then maybe that's enough. Mm -hmm. If you're not happy with it, what, what are you not happy about? Did the box still go wrong? Maybe you need to do the box again. Mm -hmm. Did a new bit go wrong? Maybe you need to do that three times before you try it again. Or do you just want another go at it because it was just a bit bleh? Yeah. And then we're going to mention at this stage, they should be listening to book two 
by the middle of book one, I would like them to add to their playlist all of book one and half of book two. And then by the time they're at the end of book one, they're listening to the middle of book one to the middle of book two. And then by the time they're in the middle of book two, they're listening to all of book two. So kind of half and half, rather than just book one and suddenly book two. Otherwise, it's a real slowdown at the beginning of book two because they don't know any of the pieces. Can you see any little issues? Yeah. Perpetual motion. Anywhere around there. I mean, to be honest, I'm not that organised. Like, I just kind of get somewhere. Like, a <laughs> child will, you know, like, right here, I'll go, oh, we're on perpetual motion. I listened to book two yet, yeah, and then we'll have the conversation, and then a few weeks later, I'll remember to check up. So, by the middle of book one, they should be listening to the, the first half of book two as well. As well as so, my, tra my listening request, how yeah. much it happens, obviously, is down to different parents. Mm. But my listening request is that it's sort of flexible between a whole book and a book and a half. Yeah. Because while they're in book one, I want them to listen to all of book one. Yeah. But from the middle of book one, I want them to listen to the first half of book two as well. And then they drop the first half of book one as they enter book two. So then they're listening halfway through to halfway through. Mm. And then as they get into book two more, it extends to the end of book two, halfway through book one to the end of book two. And then that process will continue through the books. All right. Listen to that, yeah. Okay. Very good. Well done, everyone. Thank you. Any questions from anyone at home, leave me a message on the YouTube. Bye.